We are all blessed to be able to be here this morning with each other, to be able to praise God together, and to remember our Lord and Savior who died for us, to study His Word, to pray to God together as one congregation of God's people with one mind. We have this opportunity for the reason that God has given the command but we also enjoy this opportunity for the reason that we have the occasion to be with one another, with those of like precious faith. A recent study has shown that people who are active in religious congregations are happier, more civically engaged. And I think that has mainly to do, I haven't read the entire study, but I think that mainly probably has to do with the fact that Christianity, the Bible, teaches us to love our neighbors as ourselves, teaches us to be kind, to be patient, to be generous. The, the aspects of the Christian character that is contained within the New Testament not only teaches us how to be a proper servant of God, and how to properly love our, to love our neighbor, but also how to be a good citizen in the countries in which we exist, in which we live. This particular fact or, or study that shows this really doesn't come as much surprise, I'm sure. Because people who are in, and I, I like the, the specific wording here, who are active in religious congregations, People who are truly connected to what it is they believe and what they're doing, they're happier. I would actually substitute, certainly happiness is an emotion, and that certainly can be a part of it. But certainly the people of God know that regardless of if we're happy or not, we're certainly joyous. Joy is a state of mind. However, there's a downside to all of this. You would think that this is a great thing, and it is. But there's a problem. Another study shows, in fact, it's an AP poll, the percentage of U.S. adults who belong to a church or other religious institution has plunged by 20 percentage points over the past two decades, hitting a low of 50% last year. There was a time decades ago, when almost no one could claim that they either weren't a part of a church, member of a church, or that they didn't come from a family or raised in some sort of a religious understanding. Now, there's so much distraction to keep people away from kind of an evil <laughs> phrase, organized religion, that often people take it upon themselves to say that they can be spiritual without being religious. These are two separate definitions and terms in people's minds. That spiritual means I can believe in God, but I don't have to be a part of any church. And of course, then we have also the continued rise of atheism and so forth. So on the one hand, people who are involved, people who attend regularly a church may be happier, may have a better foundation of understanding about the need to help their fellow man. That's great. But the downside is there's less and less of those types of people in our society. I mentioned that we have the blessing to be able to be here with each other. The opportunity that this occasion affords us to be able to encourage and to edify each other. For a few minutes this morning, I'd like to consider what these blessings are and how important they should be to you and to me so as to encourage us to make sure that we use the opportunities to gather together with one another. In Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1 and in verse 27, as Paul writes to the Philippians, he says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, 
let you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Notice what Paul wants to hear about when he talks about, he says, when he says, I may hear of your affairs. He's spoken to saints in the past, to Rome, for instance, whose faith was spoken of throughout the whole world. That he didn't have to be there personally to know who they were and the things that the, the trials that they went through to know of their faith. Paul to the Philippians, of course, their actions speak to their faith, certainly. But Paul makes the case, I want to hear of your affairs. And here's what I want to hear specifically, that you are standing fast in one spirit, but with one mind you're striving together for the faith of the gospel. That requires a couple of things, doesn't it? To stand fast in one spirit and to strive together for the faith of the gospel requires that every member... Be aware of the needs that each individual has and what that congregation of God's people has. It requires that all of them are working and considering each other. Noting what the, the faith teaches. Stand fast in one spirit, Paul says. Even against temptation, against trial, either as individuals or as a congregation of God's people. But it requires every member in unity of the faith to be together in that effort. In Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 15, Paul says that they are to speak the truth in love. That they may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, verse 16, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Notice as Paul, as he offers this to the Ephesians, notice that they speak the truth in love, that that is a focus. For what purpose? that they may grow up in all things into him who is the head. Ephesians 4 is a particular chapter in the letter to the Ephesians that is all about growth. It's about the need for growth, about the focus on growing, about the desire to grow. So when he says that we speak the truth in love, or that you should speak the truth in love, and that that truth will help you grow up in all things, Verse 16, talking about Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, whether it's a foot, an arm, an elbow, a hand, an eye, all of these different parts of the body that Paul is likening to the members of a local body of God's people. He says every joint supplies something. And what that joint supplies causes an effective working by which every part does its share. And it causes, here's what the ultimate goal is, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. It is to this that Paul points when he's describing every, uh, some joint knit together by what every joint supplies. What happens though when certain parts of that body become atrophy? What happens when those parts don't work the way that they should? What happens if you're, if you're those of us who are right-handed, you write with your right hand, what happens if all of a sudden your right hand decides, you know what, I don't want to write anymore. I'm done. And even though you know you need to be writing something, the right hand's off doing what it wants. Paul describes each part of the body working together for a common goal. That is, the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. It accomplishes this by speaking the truth in love, by growing up in all things, by every part doing its share. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and in verse 10, 
Paul, as he writes to the Corinthians, he notes that there are divisions among them, and for this he is upset, and he wants to address those divisions. He says in verse 10, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. This term, perfectly joined together, this term is actually a play off of the term that Paul uses here, there be no divisions among you. The term here, perfectly joined together, means to mend, to grow back together. But in every single one of these instances, what happens when you have brethren who aren't interested? Brethren who don't really care, who aren't invested in wanting, for instance, in Philippians 1 verse 27, perhaps they're not really interested in being a part of that one spirit or that one mind. Maybe they're not interested in being a joint that supplies or doing its share. Maybe they're not interested in being in the same mind and in the same judgment. When we have examples in the New Testament of the saints and how they function together, Paul is describing what the goal, what the, the body of Christ is supposed to be. And when he does this, he offers up phrases like this, not just in these three places, but in dozens of other places, this idea of one spirit, of one mind, together. That being the case, what happens if I'm not with the brethren to be able to accomplish these things? There are occasions where certainly we're sick. Occasions where for this reason or that reason we can't be with the saints. We can't utilize that opportunity. But there's a difference between can't and don't want to. And God knows that difference. In this occasion where Paul describes to the Philippians that I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, that requires every member to be invested together. With one mind striving. That term striving, that, that's a verb. It's, there's something active taking place. It's an active interest, an investment a willingness to stand for the truth. In Hebrews chapter 2 and in verse 9, the Hebrew writer says, and this is the text that Trice read for us a few minutes ago, verse 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, from whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. The Hebrew writer is exalting Jesus, and he's comparing this, earlier chapter 2 and chapter 1, to the concept of angels. To which of the angels did he ever say? He's going to bring this back up. In verse 11, for both he who sanctifies... And those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying. This is what Jesus says. And for this, the Hebrew writer quotes from Psalm 22. This is what Jesus says to the Father. He says, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. The context of this in Psalm 22 had everything to do with the assembly of Israel. When they would gather together to offer up praise to God. When they would offer sacrifices to God. When they would hear the law read. But as this is being written in Hebrews chapter 2, Jesus has since died and risen and ascended. To that end, he makes this statement. In fact, he's already dealt with his sufferings. Verse 10. 
He's not describing this as if Jesus were still alive. That's not the context in which he means this. Jesus, for which reason, he is not ashamed. There is a continual present tense to what the Hebrew writer is describing. He is not ashamed to call them brethren. Well, how do you know he considers them brethren? Because this is what Jesus says. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. All this leads to Hebrews chapter 10, and specifically verse 24, where the Hebrew writer says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. All of this is to say, and a lot of times preachers focus in on verse 25, forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. But the basis of verse 25 is on what he's discussing in verse 24. The context of Hebrews chapter 10, and for that matter, the book of Hebrews, is dealing with Jewish brethren who are turning away from Christianity back to the Jewish faith. They are literally turning away forever. From God, and for that matter, from the saints. They no longer want to be associated with them. But notice, as he describes this in verse 24, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Let's put this all together to understand the blessings of being able to attend with the brethren. Consider the blessing of Stirring up love and good works. This term good, kalos, it's beautiful works. Would you consider being of one spirit, of one mind, bringing about growth of the body, being perfectly joined together, are those good works? God has defined them as good works, yes. However, those works cannot be accomplished if I'm not considering the brethren and am present in order to stir them up. That can't be accomplished. In the context of Hebrews 2, verses 9 through 12, particularly verse 12, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you, the opportunity to be together, and in spiritual fellowship with Christ, offer up praise to God. Offer up prayer. To study his word. Jesus says, in the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. The Hebrew writer is not considering Jesus as having when he was on the earth. And this context does not discuss in heaven one day. This is now, present tense. That being the case, how can I accomplish any of this? without being with my brethren. The fact the term consider, verse 24, means to meditate, meditate upon, to think deeply on. It requires a consistent thinking of what can I do for my brethren? How can I encourage them? How can I cause growth among my brethren? How can I help us to be perfectly joined together to strive for the faith of the gospel? What can I do? This leads us to, then, a couple of conclusions based on the text that we've read. As we've mentioned, this is all about being with the brethren, attending with the brethren. There are times we can't make it. God knows that. There are times we're sick. There's times a car breaks down. There's times we're called into work. There's times that things happen. We can't be there. But as was mentioned earlier in our prayer, there are times... These people who are certainly shut in, they desire to be here. But what happens is, so often, these normally valid reasons for not being able to make it become a crutch. They become an excuse if we're not careful. Because there is a difference between I can't make it and I'm not going to make it. I don't want to make it. I want to find some reason not to have to make it. And it doesn't matter what the preacher says. 
It doesn't matter what anybody else says. What matters is God knows. God understands the difference. So here's the application of this. When we talk about Bible study, you know, God never said we have to be at every Bible study. You're right, he didn't. He never came out in those words and said that. He never said we have to come to Sunday afternoon service or Wednesday night service. No, he didn't. But here's the question that we rest on. We establish our authority in two main ways. Direct command and approved example. That is how we establish everything from singing hymns versus instrumental music to how the funds of the church are used or not used. All of this is based upon what God says and what he approves based on the Bible. So, if we're going to go the command route, those who look to texts that say, well, in order to fulfill this command... I can't be there. In order to be able to do this, I can't be there. I've heard brethren say in 1 Timothy chapter 5, he who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. In order to do this, I have to work. Sometimes we have shifts. This is the whole reason why there's two services since the 40s and the 50s to be able to provide for that. But some people go out of their way to look for jobs that allow them to miss, so that they can use the excuse, I have to work. I don't have a choice. I can't tell you that that's you. No one can tell you that that's you. But God knows the difference. And at no time does God ever put us in a position where in order to fulfill one command, we must sacrifice the command or proved example of something else. Of gathering with the saints throughout the New Testament is there ever an approved example of New Testament saints simply saying I don't really want to go I don't really feel like it I just don't want to go sometimes we can't make it some of us have health issues that prevent us from maybe for, from sitting for two hours so instead we come for the worship service instead of Bible class I understand that Sometimes we finish the, uh, our, our graveyard shift, we just got home, it's hard for us to, to have the energy and to be able to focus and worship in spirit and in truth, so instead we come for the afternoon service. I understand. And this in no way is intended to condemn anybody. It's intended to bring to our remembrance what the Hebrew writer commands us to do. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That can't happen if we're not here. God knows. He knows if a reason why we're choosing not to come to Bible study on Sunday morning or Wednesday night, if it's a valid reason, or if we're simply lying to ourselves or others. God knows if we're choosing not to come on our Sunday afternoon service, because you know what? I've gone to the Sunday morning service. That's all I really need to do. That's the main one. That's the important one. Consider the commandment. Consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. The issue comes in. Not when attendance numbers go from one thing to a lower thing. That isn't indicative of truth. What is the focus is where the heart is, where the mind is, and whether or not we're allowing distractions, allowing things that I'd rather do to get in the way of considering my brethren, to be able to encourage, to uplift, to edify, and certainly, if we're letting these distractions keep us from another opportunity to sing songs of praise to God, another opportunity to offer up prayer to God, another opportunity to study God's Word, 
I'm not here to tell you that you have to be here every single service and it doesn't matter what the reason. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to tell you that God says that we need to worship in spirit and in truth. That we need to make sure we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. The context of that is because they choose to do something different. Not just because they can't make it. I think I don't want to. I'm here to remind us all that the focus of this is that we are here to strive together for the truth of the gospel. And if we allow an excuse, not a valid reason, an excuse to cause us to say, I'm going to do something else while the saints get together. Then we'll have to address that with God. Because God knows the difference. We can fool everybody else. We can fool ourselves. But we won't fool God. Our bulletin article this morning ends with the statement that doing just enough won't be enough to get us to heaven, but it will be plenty to get us to hell. And we have to beware the pitfalls of the mindset that, well, I've done enough. I've done what I have to do. Sunday morning's the big one. As long as I'm there for that, that's all that matters. Is it? Let's consider what the New Testament example is. Let's consider what the commandments of the New Testament are. What the approved example is. And let's consider ourselves to see if there's just an excuse being made. If there's times we aren't here for Bible study or for services. This is a question that I can't answer for you. That's a question you have to ask yourself. That's the lesson for you this morning. Again, I'm not trying to point fingers at anybody. Everybody at some point has occasions that they have to miss services. That happens. But we have to be honest with ourselves. Examine ourselves. And make sure that the reasons why we put forward that we can't make it aren't, in fact, reasons why we don't want to make it. We offer an invitation to those who are not Christians to utilize this opportunity to be baptized, to have your sins washed away, to be added to the body of Christ. And then from that point on, to walk a new life. A life that is devoted to God and to His service. And also devoted to the brethren. This is what Joe was alluding to in his prayer when, we described, when he described the, the aspect of having the local congregation and our responsibilities to that local congregation. When we devote ourselves to God, we don't just devote ourselves to Him and Him only. We also devote ourselves to all those who are His. To consider them in order to stir up love and good works. For those of us who are Christians, let's remind ourselves of our purpose here on earth. Fear God and keep His commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And I would include, as Paul includes, to the Galatians, especially those of the household of faith. The the lesson is yours. If you're subject to the invitation, please come forward as we stand and sing.